It's official. I am a fan of the Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemison. Hello everyone and welcome to Dutch Greybeard. Today I want to share with you my reading experience of these three books. The first part of this video will be spoiler free, but I also want to address a few issues that I cannot do without spoilers. But of course, I'll warn you well ahead. On Booktube, Goodreads and Reddit and other fora, you'll find a lot of mixed reviews and opposite opinions about these books. Fierce haters and strong lovers. I can understand why these books are not for everyone. They require some stamina and perseverance of readers, but as with many books that don't leave the doors wide open, once you've crossed that threshold, you'll be rewarded tenfold. I now belong to the community of Broken Earth lovers. Not that these books are perfect, but boy, do they impress. The story is about a world like Earth which consists of one huge continent called the Stillness. Every few hundred years, a huge cataclysm takes place, which is called a fifth season. During these seasons, people mainly try to survive until a season has ended. At the time of this trilogy, an immense rift across the Stillness is created somehow, from which ashes continuously burst into the atmosphere gradually blocking the light of the sun. We follow the main character, Essun, or Essun. She is mother of two children. She has special qualities that make her an outcast. She sets out on a journey that will eventually turn out to be a quest not just for survival, but to rid her world of these seasons once and forever. Let's first talk about what impresses me. The prose throughout the three books is phenomenal. This is important to me because casual or even bad prose in the end always puts me off. No doubt this has to do with myself being a writer. Sloppy language irritates me and distracts me from the story. If a writer won't make a serious effort to polish his prose, then he'll no doubt be lazy in his storytelling as well. At least that's how I experience this. Thankfully this does not happen very often, but when it does I can get really frustrated with a book. I cannot imagine why someone would go through all the hardship of writing a book and not want to make it a piece of art. Miss Jemison's writing most certainly is artful. Let's take this next sentence or part of it from the fifth season, the first book in the series. On the topmost floor, where the plush, hall-length rug is overlaid by a herringbone pattern of sunlight, she stops. This is language that is well cared for, and it transports me straight away to this topmost floor with this beautiful sunlight pattern. I can really savour this kind of exquisite writing. But it's not just well-worded descriptions. Jemison can also capture a world in just a few words. Take this line, for instance. Then she wonders why a part of her is trying to find value in degradation. To explain the background here would take too long and would involve spoilers. But take it from me that this small sentence reveals a world about the complicated social status people with special abilities have. Or this one from the obelisk gate number two. You seem strong, healthy but inside you feel like he looks. Nothing but brittle stone and scars, prone to cracking if you bend too much. You try to smile and fail. He doesn't try. You just look at each other. It's nothing and everything at once. This kind of writing is what I'm looking for in a good book. A good story elegantly wrapped in language. In The Stone Sky, the third book in the trilogy, there's this sentence. Only people who think they have a future fear death. 
On its own this is quite a profound observation, but within the broken earth, where people try to survive in the harshest of conditions without any real hope for improvement even in the longer future, you will find that people who believe they have a future are scarce. The second person narrative, which is only used in the chapters of Esun, the main character, requires some getting used to in the beginning, but right away it intrigued me. When a writer chooses this kind of point of view, there has to be a compelling reason. In this case, the reason becomes clear somewhere halfway the series, when pieces of the intricate puzzle come together. And once you're used to it, it becomes easy to read. In the spoiler section later on, I'll try to explain the reason for this unusual POV. The story, world building and character work are all superbly done. However, one might argue that the building of the world is very slow paced. Jemison illustrates much of the culture with simple but beautiful things, like the drink Saf or Safe. It's made from a plant milk that changes colour in the presence of any contaminant, even spit. It is served to guests and at meetings because, well, it's safe. A polite gesture that says, I'm not poisoning you, at least not right now. Later on, I'll get back to why the world building of N.K. Jemison is so good. Even though I'm a fan, not everything was perfect for me. For one, it's not a fast paced story. At points, there is hardly any fuel to keep the motor of the story running. Every now and then, however, the story develops at breakneck speed for one chapter. One of the peculiar things I experienced with this series was that I wasn't very eager to return to the book I was reading. Once I was underway, I enjoyed it very much, but every time I had to overcome a slight aversion. I think this is mainly because I was regularly lost. I didn't know all the time what the story was about, which left me groping for solid ground. I always caught up again, but at times it took too long for my taste. And this is not a thing that only occurs at the beginning and will disappear once you're familiar with the world, the characters and the storyline. Even after two full books, this loss of coordination is extra heavy in the final part, The Stone Sky. Some of the chapters here are set in the extremely distant past, which feels like an entirely different world with people who have different abilities and so forth. You have to reacquaint yourself all over again. It's always a personal thing as to whether a writer reveals too much or too little. Jemison is not very generous in making the reader at ease. On the contrary, she challenges me, at least, to trust that all will be clear up ahead. And I have to admit that there were moments that I wished she'd reveal just a bit more a bit sooner. Another thing that made this an uneasy read is that the story itself is very disturbing and disheartening. Throughout the books, life itself is very hard and violent, and the prospects for the future are very bleak, to say the least. The complete lack of any kind of humour, banter or light-heartedness makes this read all the more depressing. It's a complete overdose of bleakness and hopelessness. A minor irritation for me was her abundant use of the term belatedly. Jemison must really love this word because it's all over the place in these three books, also when it serves no purpose whatsoever. At this point, I want to talk some spoilers. So, spoiler alert! I highly admire the way Jemison leads the reader to believe that he's reading a story of three different people. Esun, Cyanite and Damaya that take place simultaneously, when in fact they are part of the story of one person set in different times of her life. This is very skillfully done and when the veil of this deceit is lifted around page 330 in the first book, it came to me as a complete surprise. The world building is partly done by means of language which I highly appreciate. Esun, as well as her daughter Nasun, 
is an orogene. Orogenes, or rojas, as their more derogatory name goes, can feel below the surface the earth and move parts. They literally have the ability to move mountains. This feeling is called sessing. Also the fact that the earth is called Father Earth has meaning. A mother is soft and caring, but a father can be demanding or even damaging at times. Another subtle way of making the reader familiar with this world is the way people are named. Everyone has three names in this world. Their given name, or a name they adapt for themselves, the name of the com, or community they live in, and the name of their occupation. Every community, which is a city or a village, is very protective of who can become a member. When a person comes knocking at the door of the village, and he or she has no skills that are needed, they will likely not be given access. So, I was happily editing my video yesterday when I suddenly realized that the last five minutes or so of my story had magically disappeared. As you can see, I now have my proper microphone in front of me, uh, so hopefully the sound will be better. And let's just continue with my story. N.K. Jemison gives the reader the bare need-to-know basics of the world, of orogeny, or the magic. She never explains anything. An absolute highlight for me is when Nasun, Asun's daughter, travels through the earth to the other side. This inspired me to do a quick surprise read recently of this book, Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth. I also want to try to explain why the so much debated you POV of the Essen chapters works so well for me. As mentioned, the author does this for a very good reason. But first, a small sidestep about the topic of point of view. A Dutch author who used to be a good friend of mine, Jacques Kruithoff, wrote this book. Hoe ik om het leven kwam which would translate as How I Died. In the self-titled essay in this bundle, he explains why the point of view the writer chooses is so important. He argues that if a character explains how he died, the writer makes a crucial mistake. There is no way this dead person can tell about his death. A POV, any POV, has to be able to tell his or her story to the reader. It's not important if this story is written down, told, or conveyed through telepathy, as long as it is reasonably told by the character who is telling it. In the words of Kreithoff himself, every story that maintains the illusion of reality must come from a conduit must come from an agency that guarantees authenticity. The POV of the second person, you, is very uncommon in literature or fantasy or any kind of genre, really. In this case, it's important to understand that the whole story is told by Hoa, the stone eater, who in ancient time used to be called Hau Ha, or however you want to pronounce that. He has lived many millennia and took part in actions that made Father Earth angry and set loose fifth seasons on the people that lived on his service. Hau Ha and his siblings were created with special powers to power up the Plutonic engine, which would provide mankind with an infinite supply of energy. This story reminds me of legends that are told about Atlantis, where a similar kind of hubris plunged mankind almost into oblivion. The attempt to power up the plutonic engine goes awry, resulting in the moon thrown out of orbit. Hoa tells Essun's story because he knows she is essential in returning the moon to Father Earth. Long before he shows himself to her, he's tracking her and monitoring her life. Once the fifth season has started, she narrowly escapes her calm and starts out on a quest to find her daughter, 
who has probably been kidnapped by her father. Somewhere along the way, Hoa reveals himself to her. From then on, he accompanies her on her quest. Asun manages in the end to do the unthinkable together with her daughter Nasun. They restore the moon in her orbit around the Earth, thus appeasing Father Earth and putting a stop to fifth seasons. But the price for doing that is that Essen turns to stone. She becomes a stone eater, some of the strangest creatures in this fantasy. People who turn into stone eaters sometimes lose their own entire history. That is why Hoa is telling the whole story to her, to you, to Essen, to the one who saved the world. These books are literary fiction disguised as fantasy. Even though a reader cannot really sit back, relax and enjoy the read or write, it's well worth the effort. I, for one, will cherish these books and undoubtedly will pick them up now and then to relish just a few paragraphs. Then, in closing off this reading experience, let's rate the three books. They really are one story for me, so the three titles are very close to one another. The fifth season I rate 87 out of 100. The Obelisk Gate I rate 90 out of 100. And The Stone Sky I rate 91 out of 100. Thank you very much for watching this video. Until we meet again at Dutch Greybeard.